Hi, I'm James Jacobson. And I'm Pamela Lawrence. Welcome to Dog Edition, the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. Today, we are going to travel to two different places in the United States, Alaska and New York. Um, Have you been to Alaska, Pam? I have, yeah, twice actually. Did you do any Iditarod-ish things, Any, any sled dogging things? Yeah, we did. We went to a mushing kennel, I guess it's called, and we met all the dogs, and we got to go on a, you know, on a trail ride, and uh, and they had puppies there. We got to hold the puppies. It was it was just lovely. Because that is what we're talking about in our first segment. We are going to Alaska to talk to someone who has dedicated their lives to this lifestyle and to the future, hopefully, of doing an Iditarod himself. That's Robert Forto. That's our first segment. And then in our second segment, we return to New York, New York City, and revisit the topic of bag dogs. You know, the the dogs that get carried around all over the place in bags. (laughs) There's one very famous one. We're going to meet that dog later. And then towards the end of the show, as always, please stop by the hydrant as we take a rundown on some of the doggy headlines that have captured our attention this week. So if you love dogs as much as we do, Pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's take a walk. We've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? (laughs) Think of Alaska, and you might think sled dogs, Alaskan huskies. Many people are familiar with the grueling thousand-mile annual sled dog race from Anchorage to Nome, the Iditarod. In the late 1800s, around the turn of the century, rushed to mine for coal and gold, sled dogs were used to deliver mail, firewood, food, and other needed supplies to ice-bound Alaskan areas in the winter months. Dog sledding's popularity as a means of transportation and sport waned a little with the rise of the snowmobile in the 1960s, but in rural areas and in the hearts of sled dog athletes and enthusiasts, the Alaskan tradition is carried forward. Robert Forto always wanted to be a musher. He has a dream of one day racing a team of sled dogs in the Iditarod. His pursuit of that dream started when he attended a program at National Canine to become a professional dog trainer. Uh, And then shortly thereafter, my grandfather passed away and left me a, a kind of a homestead cabin farm type deal, hobby farm, I guess they call it in northern minnesota and uh i ended up uh getting my first group of sled dogs there and we started doing races throughout northern minnesota wisconsin michigan montana etc at the time robert was racing what he called a pretty good group of sled dogs they were purebred siberians he found success racing mid-distance and sprint mushing which robert explains as So a sprint race is typically the number of dogs on your team is the number of miles. So if you have a six dog team, you're running six miles, eight dog team, eight miles, so on and so forth. But it's a rather quick race. You're usually done in, you know, in in, in a couple of hours and you do it uh, typically Friday, Saturday or Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's a weekend gig. And we went all over the the, uh, north north midwest northern midwest of the u.s doing that and you know that was fun but it 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 didn't really uh keep the fires going as they speak so they speak so i started doing mid-distance races which means bigger teams longer miles and that typically is 10 12 14 or 16 dog teams and you can run anywhere from 30 to 300 miles doing that And that's where I really found my true passion was just being out in the wilderness with a team of dogs. And I was really enjoying that. And we did several races uh, in that class. And then that's sort of what I'm doing now. I just really enjoy that distance. But one of these days, I'll get to that thousand mile I did a rod. Minnesota gets anywhere from 36 to 70 inches of snow annually. But Colorado gets more like 60 to 70 inches and the conditions seem more ideal for racing sled dogs. But Robert moved to Colorado for a totally different reason. That part of the story begins in 1999 in a Yahoo chat room where his future wife asked an interesting question Robert had the answer to. 
it was a Saturday afternoon and she was on the chat room and she asked a question in a dog uh, room or forum or whatever they were called back then. And she said, is anybody out there that can help me teach my dogs how to pull my kids in a wagon? And of course, I was a, a dog musher, so I jumped right in and, uh, you know, we started ch- talking in the chat room and before long we were talking on the phone and a little bit later I had flown to Colorado and met her first for the first time and uh, as they say, the rest is history. But part of Robert's history was his dream of the Iditarod and its siren call was too loud for Robert to ignore. If he wanted to pursue it, he'd have to move his family to Alaska. We were living in Denver. We had a decent-sized training center. We had a little house in the neighborhood. We only had one dog at the time. And and uh, I remember thinking, wow, I need to uh, get back into this mushing thing. So we found a house up here uh, online, and my daughter and I flew up uh, for a weekend visit. And in the very cabin we're living in now, it was a, a rundown mess. I mean, it was overgrown. People didn't take care of it. So I remember telling my daughter, it was a Saturday afternoon. Mom was back at, uh, in Denver at our training center. It was in the middle of group classes and busiest day of the week. And I said, okay, Nicole, my daughter's name, I said, I want you to text your mom. I don't want to know your answer, but I want you to text your mom and tell her what you think. And she texted her mom, mom, we're moving to Alaska. With the decision firmly made by their 10-year-old Nicole, Robert left a check for the down payment right on the kitchen counter of what is now their Alaskan home. It's also their training center and their mushing kennel. Over time, he and his wife built a sled dog team, which Robert takes out on training runs and races. This is not a sport for hobbyists. It's not a hobby. It's a lifestyle. It's something that we think about 24 hours a day. We have 37 dogs about uh, 500 feet or so from here, and uh, they take all of our time, all of our money, all of our energy, all of that. (laughs) Robert has two Siberian Huskies that are family dogs, and they sleep in the house. His team of Alaskan Huskies are different in almost every way. These guys are born and bred to be athletes. They are you know, they're dogs in a sense, but they are truly athletes. You know, they, they have different metabolism. They have different drive. They have different uh, uh, metabolic rates. All, everything is different. Uh, all they want to do is get hooked up to that sled and run. And they will run literally until they fall over. That's their job. They love it. They're running, they're jumping, they're barking, they're, they're, they're just going, it's just, it's, it's like, it's like being at a rock concert. You might wonder, what's it like to be neighbors with the Forto family? Well, first off, we have, I don't know, you know, four or five dog mushing teams right here in our neighborhood. So we probably have 150 dogs in a 20 person neighborhood. So we have at least five to one dogs first off in the neighborhood itself. Living and racing with this team has taught Robert a lot about dog behavior and what makes a good lead dog on a sled team. It's not necessarily the dog that's perceived to be the alpha or the most dominant dog. Robert says that the most successful lead dogs are the ones that communicate the best. They are the ones listening to us. And then, of course, all of the other dogs are typically listening to them. And and as I tell people all the time, the lead dogs are sort of like the quarterback of the team. They're the ones that are giving the directions. They are the Tom Brady's. And then you have all of the other players as you go back and the dogs right before the sled are called the wheel dogs and those are typically the brutes those are the offensive linemen of the crew they're the the husky you know the burly 100 pound dogs that are you know that won't take any scruff they're 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 the they're the down in the trenches type dogs and then everybody in between has their own position the musher in this case robert would be the coach in this analogy Instead of shouting, up the middle, slant, or blitz, Robert may shout, G and haw for left and right. Uh, We use woe to stop, take a break to sort of relax after you stop. And then we'll say, uh, let's go. As soon as you say, let's go. So if you're stopped for any amount of time, whether you're 
switching out a booty or, you know, undoing a tangle or whatever you're doing, you'll tell the dogs to stop and whoa, and then you'll set the hook and you'll get off the sled and do whatever you're going to do. But as soon as you say, ready, they d- every one of them kind of just pop to attention. It's, <laughs> and they're just popped up, ready to go. And then you'll say, okay, let's go. And they immediately take off uh, down the trail. That trail may someday be the Iditarod route. And that's a full-time, full-tilt commitment. And Robert isn't quite ready to go all in on it, at least not just yet. It'll get there. Uh, I think the oldest person to ever start an Iditarod was 72. At age 50, it's a dream that Robert still has plenty of time for. Oh, plenty of time, at least a couple of decades by my math. Yeah, if he, if he wants to do it, and hopefully when he does do the Iditarod, he'll come back on Dog Edition and tell us all about that. That'd be great. So those Huskies are big dogs, mm. and we're going to take a break, and in our next segment, we're going to talk about dogs in bags, <laughs> and I wonder if you can fit a Husky in one of those bags. I'd like to see a Husky in a bag. We'll be right back. You're listening to Dog Edition. Hi, it's me again, James Jacobson, and there are three things that you should know about me. One, since 2003, I have been driven by an all-consuming mission. That mission is to help improve the quality of life for dogs and the people who love them. Two, I have founded or helped to co-found several companies that share that mission, including Dog Podcast Network. And three, every day, I give my dogs Everpup the ultimate daily dog supplement made by Functional Nutriments, which is one of those companies. What is Everpup? Everpup is an extraordinary all-in-one supplement that you sprinkle on your dog's food. It's a polyceutical, which means it contains an incredible blend of lots of different human-grade ingredients. It contains vitamins and minerals and prebiotics and probiotics and enzymes and dietary apoptogens and so much more. What you need to know is that it supports every cell and system in your dog's body. And Everpup is appropriate no matter what type of diet you feed your dog, from kibble to raw food to home cooked. And the rich green powder is easy to add to food. Dogs love the taste. They find it delicious. And you can even try it yourself because Everpup is made with 100% human grade ingredients. It's made here in the USA in an FDA-registered and inspected laboratory. And all the ingredients are ethically sourced and triple-checked for quality. Seeing is believing, so try Everpup for a month and see what happens with your dog. Everpup is available through select veterinarians and pet shops and Amazon, but here is the best way to try Everpup. Join the Everpup Club and get free shipping to any U.S. address. As a listener to this podcast, you can get your first shipment of Everpup for just $8, including free shipping, when you use the discount code DOGEDITION. For all the details, go to everpupclub.com and try your first full jar of Everpup for just $8. That's everpupclub.com. Welcome back to Dog Edition. No dogs allowed, unless, quote, they're enclosed in a container and carried in a manner which would not annoy other passengers, unquote. That was the 2016 message to New Yorkers from the Metro Transit Authority. And since then, subway riders have gotten used to seeing dogs tucked away in all kinds of bags, from Louis Vuitton dog carriers and L.L. Bean canvas totes to reusable bags from Fairway Market. And for big dogs, some savvy New Yorkers even cut leg holes into those iconic blue Ikea bags, because that kind of counts as being in a bag. There are entire social media accounts dedicated to New York's bag dogs. This story begins on a New York City subway platform with a bag dog that has been called the unofficial mascot of the New York subway. New York is a city that, generally speaking, lets its celebrity residents go about their days enjoying relative anonymity. This may not be a courtesy that extends to its celebrity canine population, though. Standing on a subway platform waiting for the downtown one train, Maxine the Fluffy Corgi sits comfortably in her backpack worn by her owner, Brian Reesberg. 
she is attracting a lot of attention. Look at the dog in the backpack! Dog is so cute, just chilling in the backpack. Maxine has millions of followers across social media. She's even been nominated for a Webby Award this year. That's like the Oscars of the internet. You'd think New Yorkers were used to seeing cute dogs being toted around the city since the 2016 dog bag rule. But when they see Maxine in her backpack, they point, they smile, they snap pictures, and laugh. Brian Reesberg. Most of the time, it's fun, and uh, but, you know... A lot of times when you're in a crowded subway, it's either before work when you haven't had coffee or it's after work and you're exhausted. And the last thing you want to do uh, is engage in a conversation with a total stranger. When Brian and Maxine are out and about commuting to work, running errands, the boundaries of privacy and personal space become a little blurry. You know, I can always tell like when somebody kind of tries to pretend like they're not taking a picture. I used to get kind of annoyed by it. Which was irrational because I have, I don't know, I have a corgi on my backpack. I should expect it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not bothered by it at all. It's, uh, it's just funny. Where it would start to, I think, bother me was when I could feel people that are just like, if I'm walking and they're touching her or they just like surprise me behind me and they're touching her, that, that's a little, that's a little much. Understandable. Brian never set out to make Maxine a celebrity. She was just eight weeks old when he brought her home. Brian had just finished work on a feature film he directed and was re-entering the world of advertising as a freelance director. Toting Maxine to work was the only way to make sure they spent time together. And I actually brought Maxine with me to the next job interview and the job interview after that um, and kind of just said, like, it's either me and the dog or or it's nothing. <laughs> Um, one, I, I didn't want to have a dog that I only saw a few hours at night. Um, and by that time that I was bringing her to work, she had already gotten maybe 20 ish thousand followers. So at that time it was a lot. And so I, it, it was just this thing I wanted to keep doing. Like I, I enjoyed it. As Maxine's popularity grew online, an opportunity was presenting itself. Brian could use his background as a filmmaker and turn the camera on something he loved deeply, Maxine. It would be his escape from the grind that advertising had become. I stopped working on all that other stuff, and I, I just kind of focused on this. I, you know, I wasn't doing this because it was going to make any money or doing. You know, we were just making stuff because it was just what was going on at the time that inspired me. Um, so she was just like my muse for a while. It all works out. Otherwise, what am I going to get a dog and then keep doing this other stuff that I'm not that excited about? So, you know, like I wouldn't do what I'm doing without uh, having a background in filmmaking or photography or any of those other things. So it's all kind of been used in a way to 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 do this. Brian films Maxine's subway rides and other adventures. Usually the shots are over his shoulder, the subway ride lulling her to sleep. Often in the background, he captures people's reactions. Their joy at seeing Max is infectious. So what is it about this dog? I, I, I think it's her face. That's what I think it is. Uh, she has very expressive eyes. You know, she's got this face that looks like it's smiling. And there's something, at least when I look at her, and she's calm, she doesn't feel like a dog. It feels like there's thought there. And just the fact that she's so fluffy. Um, and I don't know, she seems to fill out that bag really well. <laughs> And for anyone listening familiar with the internet's obsession with how adorable corgi butts are, rest assured, Maxine's account has several posterior posts. She's got a she's got a good tush. As Maxine's celebrity status continues to grow, Brian and his wife are hyper aware of the responsibility that comes along with having tremendous reach, and they don't take that lightly. When my wife and I started the account, it's because it it made us happy and it was just like a fun thing to do. But as it grew, our feeling is that you, you have to take more responsibility for, for what you're doing because you're reaching a wide audience and people are listening to you. Now we have people telling me their kids are watching it. it it's an account for a corgi. You know, I'm not going to go really out of my way to make any of the jokes that graphic just for, a, for, for something funny. Um, obviously, I think we have a lot of adult humor on there, but it's in a way that's maybe, you know, it's more, it's more Shrek-like adult humor. 
So if you find yourself wandering around New York or the Internet and you happen to come across Maxine in her backpack, remember, she's first and foremost a typical family dog. She's very needy, which uh, is understandable because we spend every waking minute together, which I guess if she would answering this question, she would say that I'm needy. So, it, you know, it kind of goes both ways. Um, you know, she sleeps a lot. She'll whine when she wants you to play with her. Uh, she's very sassy. Um, very protective. A dog who doesn't seem to mind being an internet sensation. Anytime I get the backpack and I put it on the ground, she'll walk right into it. But before you sneak up behind Brian to pet her, maybe ask first. Some people are really sweet. It's always a lot of kids or, you know, if it's somebody who's older. But some sometimes when you get folks who are in their 20s or 30s that, you know, to ask didn't even didn't even cross their mind. Uh, sometimes that gets that gets pretty grating. And if you just can't resist, don't worry. What am I gonna do? Turn around, and say like, "Don't, don't touch the fuck, don't." You know, it's like this. Is, everybody's laughing and smiling, and I couldn't, I couldn't possibly take that away from people. So, what, which of your two dogs do you think has the potential for more star power? I think hmm, I'm gonna have to go with Kanga. She's awfully telegenic and she knows how to steal she is good at photo bombing and she's got these dark intoxicating Ooh. eyes i'm talking about my maltese <laughs> and so yeah i would say kanga is the star power dog because she's pretty oh <laughs> that's how pepper is he's very pretty he takes a good picture but fudgy i think would be more of an internet star i love it well, let's take a visit to the Hydrant and talk about headlines that have been capturing our attention this week. What have you seen, Pam? Oh, I love this. So I'm sure you've heard of this dog, Prancer. Have you heard of Prancer, the 13-pound Chihuahua mutt that was described as a Chucky doll in a dog's body? Or, I love, I love this, a vessel for a traumatized Victorian child that now haunts our home. <laughs> Talk, talk about talk about a beautiful dog's not is that so people are saying horrible things about this chihuahua the foster mom is saying these things it was in in an adoption ad for this dog she she says she's been living in the grips of the demonic chihuahua hellscape he has created in her home she put this adoption ad up hundreds of thousands of people responded and want, wanting to adopt Prancer and uh, oh, yeah he save her from this mean person <laughs> that's brilliant marketing so has Honest. Prancer been adopted yes this neurotic man hating animal hating children hating dog that looks like a gremlin has been adopted by uh, a woman in New Haven Connecticut very nice so i saw a story from the bbc about these dogs in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Mm. Remember when the reactor <laughs> yes, yeah. went and there's this whole, it's a thousand square mile wow. exclusion zone where you're not supposed to go. And there are packs of dogs that are there <laughs> who have just been, uh, d you know, been raised wild. And the soldiers who are protecting and making sure that the area stays away from, people stay out of the area, are building a beautiful rapport and a beautiful relationship with these wild dogs. It's really cool. That is cool. And are do you, are these dogs descendants then of dogs that may have sort of escaped the disaster? Well, yeah, because when when Chernobyl happened, uh, they did shoot a lot of the animals that were in the area. Mm. But these are the descendants of, of dogs that didn't get shot and uh, and were hiding or whatever. Right. And so now these guards are basically watching over these dogs oh wow that's a cool story and it makes you know makes the whole idea of working in the exclusion zone a little bit nicer for the for these soldiers i bet takes so. the edge off yeah well there we go we got we got a little new york we got a little russia in today <laughs> uh, and some alaska uh we are definitely an internationally focused show and we want to get more voices from around the world and you'll be hearing that come to dog edition in the coming weeks but that's all we have time for today. I want to thank you for bringing Dog Edition along with you on your walk. We will be back with another episode, but chances are that you and your dog will be taking a walk between now and then, and we have something else for you to listen to. If you're interested in hearing more from some of our guests, please check out DPN's sister show, The Long Leash, for Jim's extended conversations. 
You can hear an interview with Robert Forto, our first guest on The Long Lease. Just check it out. There are links to that in the show notes, or you can go to the URL longleashshow.com and, and find it there. Also, be sure to follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app so that you can take us along on your next walk. On the next episode, we find out what life is like keeping a pack of celebrity dogs in shape from the dog jogger himself, Barry Caracostas. And Pam gets schooled in how her habit of petting every stranger's dog might not always be a welcome behavior. <laughs> Oops, you'll hear those stories and more. <laughs> dog Podcast Network is for dog lovers by dog lovers, and that means we want to hear from you. Visit dogedition.com. There's a button on the bottom right of every page where you can easily leave us a voicemail message and share your stories with us. And check the show notes for links and information about the guests on this episode. We continue to be looking for correspondence as we grow this podcast and Dog Podcast Network. So if you are a content producer or a journalist or a podcaster or an audio storyteller who loves dogs, be sure to check out our 101 Dog Stories contest. There's over $15,000 in prize money. The link to that is on our main website at dogpodcastnetwork.com. And join our pack. Be sure to follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app and tell a friend about the show. I'm Pamela Lawrence, and I'll see you at the dog park. And I'm James Jacobson. I want to thank you for listening today. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, we wish you and your dog a warm aloha. Aloha.